Hey, how are you all doing? My name is Kevin Devani, the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm going to talk with Anthony Dessar for the first time on my show uh, because of his uh, rant or Twitter thread that he put out. And so we're going to talk about Bitcoin, you know, his rant, his uh, the FOMO that might have been, you know, caused uh, through a lot of other, you know, conditions, not only because of the number go up, but because, you know, institutions coming in, individuals waking up, institutions, uh, CEOs, macro investors. We're going to talk about, you know, COVID, Corona, lockdown, the tyrannical measures taken by state government, and a bunch of other topics. So, yeah, without further ado, really excited to have Anthony Dessauer on. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my channel. And also, if you love this episode, please leave a five-star positive review on any podcast platform. Thank you so much. My DMs are open. My email address is hello at thetotalconnector.com. Thank you so much for your support and for listening. And here you go, my episode with Anthony Dessauer. All right. Welcome to the show. Anthony, how are you doing? Uh, I, and what I'm, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that we are not entering a bull phase. And I'm not saying that we will not see a parabolic price increase because all the data suggests we're about to just melt people's brains. I mean, volume is leaving exchanges. Institutions keep buying. There are new retail investors. And the amount of Bitcoin available for sale is decreasing rapidly. I posted a, a chart that I saw from somebody on Twitter right now. And where the liquidity the amount, the amount of Bitcoin dropping, like substantially, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. It's, it's, it's disappearing. There's not yeah. that much Bitcoin left to yeah. buy yeah. and the miners aren't pumping it out fast enough. Um, so the, the basic, uh, thesis of the rant is the bull run that we're entering is not at all the same as it was in 2017. Right. This is a sustained barrage of purchasing based off of a supply side crisis. Mm -hmm. And when we, when it happens, kind of already happening, but you know, when it quote unquote happens, it's not FOMO. It's that institutional players are staking like a colonial position in Bitcoin. They're going in there and they're saying, we're going to grab this. This is for us. You know, it, they're making strategic decisions with long time horizons. They're not, they're not trying to get rich. They're already rich. You know, MicroStrategy puts in $425 million. They're not taking that position because they want to be wealthy. The company already has 425 million in cash, you know, so this, it's not, they're not buying Bitcoin on a daydream or, you know, like a lottery ticket. They're, they're buying Bitcoin because they've decided they want to have a substantial position right. in this new paradigm. On top of, you know, like Michael Saylor describes, I'm sitting on 425 million in cash and it's melting like an ice cube because of inflation. So I got to figure out where to put this value. So, and then he's got 200 know, million being responsible. In pocket, right? For his whole personal uh, uh, sort of yeah. cash. Yeah. But actually, it's more than, I mean, together, you know. Uh, added up so it's more than 600 million but did you like do you think that uh because you know the exposure to bitcoin like you know uh um somehow inc uh, increased their their stock value do, do you think uh, michael saylor or whatever their boardrooms did know that they they anticipate they had anticipated that you know once they're exposed to bitcoin that their stock's gonna rise and soar well yeah well so micro strategy is now in a way, kind of like a Bitcoin ETF, right? So it's it's a way that you can get exposure to Bitcoin. So if you're, if you're valuating the company, you have to take into account their Bitcoin holdings. And if you have 
X of Bitcoin, value of Bitcoin is X price, and the stock is below the the sum of that, then the stock is undervalued just on a, you know. So did they know that that was going to happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, none of us, none of us know that the price of Bitcoin is going to go up or down tomorrow, right? But we all know it's valuable, and in time, the wealth that you use to buy Bitcoin today in time will increase. So they knew that. And, you know, Michael Saylor's just been preaching this nonstop. So, you know, did they know it was going to happen a month or two or a couple months after he made it public? There, you know, there's no way that you can know that, but I, I'm guessing over the long term he knew that he was making the right decision. That's why he made it. Right. When do you think pension funds, because this is like the big question always I'm asking, like when do you think pension funds who are sitting on yeah. globally on 50 to 70 trillion uh, estimated uh, assets on the management, I mean, once they got come in and even with a, like a fraction of a fraction um, going to Bitcoin with a three or five or 10% uh, because of their, you know, alerted whatever fiduciary duty, do you see this coming in the very near future? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's going to be just, well, okay. In the very near future. So they have a lot of regulatory concerns as far as I understand it. And they have a lot of fiduciary duty. So they're not, they're not allowed to make uh, micro strategy decisions where it's just, you have one person who's a, a proponent, they go and talk to the board. And then you have like a dozen people who make that decision to do that. The pension funds have rules Mm -hmm. so i understand as my understanding i'm not an expert i don't work for a pension fund but my understanding is a lot of these funds need to see uh, a market cap of like a trillion dollars before they're even allowed to get in then that may not be the rule for anything so if if that's the standard then i think we need a price point somewhere approximately 50k mm-hmm. approximately because we're what's market cap right now is like 350 315 320 you know yeah. yes at um at almost 20k price point so you know it it needs to be like 300 to or it needs to be uh approximately three times more than what it currently is mm-hmm. and if you know bitcoin that's possible that could happen in a matter of months or it could take a year you know it kind of depends um obviously i'm extremely bullish so i think that that'll happen sooner than later and then aside from the need for the for the market cap to be at like a trillion dollars there's probably also internal discussions And then there's always that we have a mix of sentiment. Not everybody has bought onto Bitcoin. In fact, most people haven't. And this is going to be true in the management structures of these pension funds. And these pension funds are responsible for people's pensions. So when you're like, let's put the, you know, here's the retirement of all the teachers in California, and we're going to put how much of this into Bitcoin and some people are going to be like, yeah, well, you know, if we do this, we're taking care of teachers and other people will be like, no, that's tulips. And so they got to have that Mm -hmm. conversation. Um, But it's, you know, we're, we're here. This Bitcoin no longer exists in the space of people's paychecks. You know, there's, multi-million, hundred million, billion dollar companies that are taking a look at this and billion dollar individuals. So we've definitely reached the next level. Yeah. Yeah. You see, if we, if, we, if we just run the numbers, I always think, you know, that it just, uh, it's, it's really, it's really astonishing. I mean, uh, the people, a lot of people still don't get it. Uh, you know, the, the, the the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin when you think about like how many millionaires are in the world and how many billionaires 
right. there are like approximately I think 2,500 billionaires in the world, or maybe less, maybe a little less than 2,500 billionaires, and approximately 48 million millionaires. So yeah, so all these calculations, you know, are like you know, very funny to do. Um, so you know, how much like allocate, like how much Bitcoin is satoshis <laughs> can be allocated? Yeah, zero, yeah. zero two or something. If we like evenly, you know, distribute per person, that. evenly, so, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that I remember early on, that was something that somebody said that really just struck me. They're like, "There's 21 million Bitcoin," which you know, and there's like 40 or 50 million millionaires. So there, if every millionaire on Earth wanted a Bitcoin, it's not, it's possible. not possible. There's not enough. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah. There's, there's all these little truisms like that, which yeah, which are the, the little hooks. But yeah, the message, the message is. I, I'll tell you this though, like my uh, my occupation, I'm a field technician for a phone company, so I'm the guy that fixes your internet, you know, phone holes, or run the wire at your house, or anything like that. My job when I hired on was uh, I hired on to be a DSL technician. DSL was the first broadband technology. Mm -hmm. So when I went out to people's homes, I was going out into the field, into a world where nobody had the internet. <laughs> the only people that had the internet were like techie people running dial-up modems. These are like the Mountain View types. Yeah. These are like the yeah. people. <laughs> okay. And I was installing a one and a half meg connection and for the most part every place i installed the service it was the first time the internet has ever been in their home 20 years later the internet is ubiquitous and not only is it in everybody's home you have two or three different internet connections in people's homes from their landline to their cell phone you have multiple internet connections. In the early 2000s, you would go to businesses and there are some businesses where the business owner would be like, no, I don't need the internet. We don't, we don't do things on computers. I don't do that kind of business. I'm never going to do that, right? That doesn't exist anymore. Like, what, what time frame years. are we talking about? It's like, was it like 10 years, 15 years? Like the, the exponential curve? This is, this, this is a... This is over a 20 year period, but I would say most of it happened in 10 years. Yeah. Because by 2010, by 2010, we started getting uh, the full swing of second generation of broadband technology where you're getting into the tens, tens of megs, starting to push up into hundreds of megs going into people's homes. And in that 10 year span, it went from zero to above 90%. I mean, we still don't have internet in like everybody's home, but it is now the way the world works in 10 years. And I think this mm -hmm. is going to be the same development in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is often referred to as the internet of money. You know, there's a lot of the same analogies and you're getting a lot of that same talk where people are just like, no. You know, you can't you can't hold it in your hand. I'm never going to do that. That's done. We don't do business that way. Yeah. And in ten years from now, that's it's going to be a different thing. Right. And so we're just we're just we're at this phase. Like if you use the same the same analogy, where Bitcoin is still people tinkering in their garage, mm -hmm. and it is now. Like we're now getting the OLs and the Earthlinks and the Netscape kind of the first businesses dipping their toes. And um, that's, yeah, yeah but do, it's, uh, it's, think, it's a good, it's a good place. Actually, to be in. Do you think the, the adoption rate could, uh, you know, as, as techno you know, technology is exponential, you know, as we, we, when you listen to Jeff Booth about, you know, deflationary technologies, the exponential curvature, and it's, everything is becoming faster and faster. So it could become like so fast that it's, it would, you know, just, just the evolution would be just unexpectedly fast. So 
you know, and because now, you know, institutions yeah. are coming in, it's, it, there is a certain, like a, you know, a, a pending FOMO, there is something in the air. And I wonder sometimes, you know, yeah, you can smell how long it. could it take sure. you know, to, 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 to just, you know, see it as a unit of account, like, like, you know, people are not maybe even think about, you know, in dollar terms or, or euro terms or fiat terms, you just use it as a unit of account. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, shows then the, the real potential, real potential of purchasing power. I, I think that's probably the hardest sell. I understand it. I understand the whole concept that you just expressed and I still can't do it. You know, when I, when I go buy a cup of coffee, yeah. that cup of coffee is in dollars. I'm, I'm not thinking like, uh, um, okay, so let's see, that's a $3 cup of coffee. So that's a, uh, 15,000 Satoshi. Like, I understand that that's the future and I understand that, but just making my brain work that way. So that might actually be a generational thing, you know, because uh, of course I've only been at it for a few years now. So ask me again in 10 years and I might be able to tell you the price of everything in Satoshi's. But um, that, that degree of thinking is just exposure and, mm -hmm. But we have, we have like a hundred million users in Bitcoin. Which yeah, is like just estimates, right? I mean, f yeah, something like that. Yeah, somewhere yeah. between fifty and hundred million, probably. But let's just say, let's just for the sake of simplicity, <laughs> to say a hundred million. But that could easily go to a half a billion. Once you have we have a billion users, like Apple had, like you know, all of a sudden, or or you know, smartphones users, uh, half a billion users, you know, worldwide. So. Is that something like, would you, would you say that's the triggering point for, you know, super exponential adoption rate? Is there a number to, to that, do you think? Uh, mm, no, because I don't think it works that way. I, does, I don't think the number drives the behavior. I think the behavior drives the number. Okay. So it's because um, bit. Bitcoin is a network. Right. So the network effect is in the network. For you know, it's kind of like the argument where people say oh, you can just copy Bitcoin code and make a new Bitcoin. So Bitcoin isn't really scarce. Well, no, because Bitcoin isn't just the code. Exactly. It is also the consensus. Yeah. It and is also good. the yeah. people involved in it. So if you make a copy, that copy does not come with all the people. Right. There that's why Bitcoin dominates in the market cap. That's why altcoins are nothing and will mostly be nothing because they don't have the consensus. And the consensus is driven by culture. And that's why the maximalists are important. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you see a growth in like crypto Twitter, mm -hmm. When you see growth in all these other areas, then you see the growth in price because it means the culture is growing. And and it is kind of it is a feedback loop. You know, when number goes up, it gets people's attention. And then when it gets people's attention, they join the culture. When they join the culture, number go up. But I, I think that if if the question you're asking is like when we get to X market cap. Is that when you're going to see uh, lightning built into every cash register? Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be the other way around. It's first, lightning is going to be built into every cash right. register, mm -hmm. then number goes. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Oh, yeah. so, so let's, yeah, let's talk concretely. I mean, where, where do you see Bitcoin in five to 10 years? Like, how do you see the evolution, the development? The, yeah, even the market capitalization. I, it, okay, so five, 10 years. In 10 years, Bitcoin will approximately be twice the age. Like we're at 12 years, 11, 12 years now. So in 10 years, it will be twice as old. Mm -hmm. And we will have gone through at least two more halvings. Mm -hmm. So I expect the price to be astronomical just ridiculous um i expect to see the first 
cultural violence mm -hmm. in regards to the changes that Bitcoin is making, which is, is honestly, I'm, I have a lot of hopium. I'm extremely bullish. The one thing that I can't get away from is I, I know people are going to get hurt somewhere somehow yeah, because of this gonna be, um, be less, yeah. <clears throat> yeah that's my big question is how the network will respond to violence mm -hmm. and especially um political violence and like to totalitarian because bitcoin is most appealing in places where people are desperate yeah and in the places where people are desperate is where you have the most capital controls you have the most political violence. And uh, so it, it's going to feed itself in there because the, the harder you oppress people, the more they want liberty and Bitcoin is liberty. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's personal yeah. financial sovereignty and somewhere um, somebody's going to step it up and decide we need to, you know, losing control to Bitcoin. So we need to, mm -hmm. we need to act. And I, I don't think it's going to necessarily happen in liberal democracies. Although, you know, liberal democracies can very quickly turn into totalitarian, you know, yeah. governments. History know, tells us call, that, you know, COVID, whatever hysterical lockdowns and yeah, oh, propaganda. That's I mean, it's it's just insane. I mean, you know, if we just really look investigatively, there's a, few, a handful of people who are really going investigatively into this whole uh, issues, and and really digging up a lot of truths and facts. You know, the reality, <laughs> what's really going on, right? Yeah. And people don't even want to, you know, they're just, I don't know, even some some podcasters, I know they're just too mainstream or they're not looking real or they're already forming their opinion. And then according to their own preformed opinion, then they, you know, want to interview pre-selected people who, you know, who sort of confirm to their opinion. It's, it's really weird what's going on. So, um, but, you know, that's a whole chapter for itself. Um, but what's interesting was yeah. I'm going to say, some, I heard Sorry. somebody say in an in interview, like, Approximately like 30 or 35 percent of Americans think that a civil war is possible, like in whatever, in the next couple of years or something like that, or in the next years or something to come. What do you think about it? What's your position on that? Um, I, I wouldn't rule it out, mm -hmm. but do I, would I definitively say that it's going to happen for sure? No, because people talk tough on social media, but you know, when it comes to like actual, you know, joining a physical yeah. front, um, the, but that's, that's happening. Mm -hmm. There are places where Americans are punching each other in the faces and people are firing shots. You know, there, there's gunning that is happening. And, um, that that's very concerning um and i'm not sure i have my opinions on that um i i think mostly it's social media the yeah, a lot of the algorithms the main, just, mainstream media you know the whole the whole politics hate. behind it like divide yeah. and rule, divide and rule it's becoming worse and worse with this divide and rule principle mm. yeah well it's uh, yeah and our style of democracy can be susceptible to that mm -hmm. because it's, you got to get the vote and, you know, a lot of times getting into the nuance of a situation is not as beneficial as just saying that guy is the bad guy. Don't vote for him or you're mm -hmm. going to get screwed. I'm the guy that's going to help you. I'm going to, I'm going to help protect you from that guy. And, you literally saw that played out because every vote in the United States was essentially Trump is bad. So I'm going to vote for Biden or Biden is bad. So I'm going to vote for Trump. And it, the whole decision-making process was pretty much based on, I need to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And so then when you see these protests, 
that's kind of like where America is at right now is everybody's feels like something bad is going to happen. So they're making decisions to protect themselves. It could be uh, appropriate decisions like voting, which is, you know, peaceful and appropriate, or it could be, I'm going to join a more extremist organization. I'm going to go meet the other guy in the street. And if he says anything, I'm going to, him in the mouth dab him or shoot him and just the fact that we have come to that place where people are coming face to face with weapons is uh that that's a new thing and that i've never seen that in my life and as far as i understand it the last time we were in that place in the United States was during the sixties. Wow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think things turned out all right. You know, I mean, the sixties were, were, uh, there was a lot of upheaval and a lot of societal change and, and, you know, huge impactful movements and everything turned out. Okay. So there's a ray of hope, but actually, there's a difference between reading a history book and being a part of it. Right. Right. Those are two different things. You know, you week in, week in, in America, uh, you know, we, we idolize our World War II heroes, right? So, you know, reading about or watching some video about the landings on D-Day or the yeah. fighting in Iwo Jima, it's just like, oh, whoa, what impactful moments in history and these are great people. That guy there did not feel like a great person. Exactly. He yeah. was just trying to get through that mm -hmm. and it was not great or the people in the various cities all over the place or the japanese people preparing themselves for the impending american invasion every man woman and child preparing themselves to fight you know the evil americans or the streets of you know whatever european city that were just absolutely decimated we look back at it now and we're just like that is interesting history for those people it was not interesting it sucked Exactly. It was not cool. Yeah. You, know? you think so. that a lot of Americans, I mean, I have my, one of my best friends, she's, she's in California. She's an artist and designer, but she's coming, you know, permanently to Austria. And um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not even sure whether that's easy for, for like, she's getting, you know, a citizenship from Spain because of some Jewish program or something. Um, do you think it's, I mean, there's a, do you think a lot of Americans would love to like, 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 like emigrate, like, like, you know, move out of, United States and to go any other country for whatever, for some principles for freedom, for more liberty. And uh. that's an interesting question. So I've never considered that. Mm -hmm. um, I have considered leaving California. <laughs> yeah. So like Joe because, Rogan to Texas. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it, it's, um, it's insane. And the authoritarianism is we, we have a curfew right now. Yeah. Like last night, a curfew was announced that you can't be out after 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. unless it's a sin. It's, it's really, it's silly, is, is what it is. Wow. Because so it's a little bit more strange like what, the, 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 uh, than you, in Austria, because we have a curfew until December 6 or 7, where you can't, you know, you should stay yeah. home like from 7, 8 p.m. until early morning. Unless, you know, you can, you know, you can still take a walk and, you know, it's, it's not, I, I don't think it's that strict or, right. you know, like, what, like so bad. Well, it's, it's weird. And it, it has no teeth. You yeah. Know? So mm -hmm. this is a mandate from the governor do this. And then you have police organizations who for the last year, they've been hearing defund the police, the police are bad. And they're just like, no, we're not going to. We're, we're not going to do anything about that curfew. If we see somebody out past 10, we don't care. We're not even going to stop them. So it, it's not, it's not organized. Yeah. It's not thoughtful. You know, the virus only works during, you know, or like after 10 PM, the virus is more dangerous or something like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, but what it is, is it's our governor just making noises to either demonstrate that he's trying to do something because cases are rising. Look, I did something. I put in a curfew or he's just nutty or something. Yeah. 
And when I hear when I hear like cases have been going up, it's like, okay, so more testing has been done. I mean, you've heard, you know, I mean, how how ridiculous the testing is. It's like Elon Musk does like four tests, two are positive, two are negative. Right. You know, and then it and now it's all coming to the surface. The whole scientific data is coming to the surface, and you know the factual thing about like the the PCR test is is garbage. It's irrelevant. You know, it's like the interpretation of it is total bullshit because it depends on the cycles that they run it through. And you know, if you blow it up, the cycles up to whatever 30, 35, 40 cycles, then you you know we all we could all be positive because of some you know <laughs> right. It's, it's so ridiculous. I mean, uh, I don't know what to say, you yeah. know? So, of course, they're going to have, like, higher cases. But what does it really mean? You know, my, one of my best friends here in Vienna, um, where uh, his, his mom was positive. His mom is, like, 80 years old, tested positive. And, yeah, for, for like, a few days, she had, like, a lack of uh, taste and smell. But that's it, you know, after a week, she was totally regenerated, you know, nothing, you know, it's like even, you know, less severe than a flu. I mean, it's, come on. <laughs> what do you think about that? This whole so it, this is not, yeah, this is not about the disease. So, you know, COVID is real. It's a thing. It yeah. exists. Yeah. People are getting sick. Some people are, some people are getting very sick and that's awful. This when COVID is said and done, the story of COVID will not be the disease. It'll be the response of government yeah. and how it impacted our societies and our cultures. In the United States, we're still under laws that were implemented after 9-11. Right. Right. And, and so they put in all these laws to hunt down terrorists and surveil and this and that. And we're still under those laws and terrorism. I mean, it, I guess it exists. There's still people doing terrible things to people. Yeah. And I'm sure like, some of those you people. Know, you probably ter- heard in Vienna, the shooting, you know, this, this madman, you yeah. know, whatever, yeah. Islamist, whatever, right. mentalist, whatever you want to call it. I mean, yeah, it, you know, I mean, there's always idiots running around, but uh, you yeah, know, it's very convenient then you yeah. know to use these kind of scenarios and uh, and you know establish implement tyrannical measures. You know, would it be mass vaccinations yeah. or you know, mandatory it, vaccinations? <laughs> all, all all the surveillance for that is still in place, mm-hmm. and every American and every international phone call is tracked. All of them. Yeah, you know, for the last. Uh, 10 years now and the the price that we paid for security was too great it, it, you know it's like we took a it's like we took a uh, interest only loan on security and now we fixed the security but we still got to pay back the debt and we're going to be paying it back right. for 100 years and the same thing is happening with with covid but you know there's a lot of there's a lot of hopium for liberty in Bitcoin, yeah. Because if you show, if you if you come for number go up, and then you get orange pilled, yeah. Then you start to understand like how money works, how governments work, and how the whole structure make, works. I mean, everything, make, how everything works. Yeah, actually, you know. I yeah. mean, once you you know once yeah. you're rooted in Bitcoin, everything is going to change. I mean. You know, I, I always say on every level, yeah. you know, all the central structure, criminal structures are about the law, starting with the Bank of International Settlement, to central banks, to governments, to military industrial corporate complex, to, to military intelligence, uh, you know, structures, everything is going to change. Even on a scientific and technological level, where we could have had all these technologies that we are dreaming about, and you know, like a wet dream. Like we could have had that probably hundred years ago, you know, it's ridiculous. You know I mean? We could have so much abundance. This is what Jeff Booth is talking about. Like the abundance, the inflation economy, the inflation technologies. But you know, if you want to like talk to like an average person out there, they think it's a utopia. No, we could have all that, you know, beyond artificial intelligence. You know, we are so concentrated on robotics and, but I'm, I'm talking like structural different technologies in energy production, energy conversion, mm-hmm. the transportation technology. Uh, health technologies, 
I mean, it's it's even yeah. beyond our wildest imagination. And this is what actually why I'm in this whole, you know, why I'm doing this podcast, because I already see, you know, this world, our world, that's like totally like, uh, you know, like a matrix uh, rooted in a really, you know, whatever you call it, like a rational, ethical sound, uh, you know, uh, and healthy roots of Bitcoin. <laughs> sure. Well, it, it, all things move towards good. Mm-hmm. And there are keystone technologies that produce efficiencies that change the world. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the quote unquote invention of fire. Once you harness fire, then you can cook food. Now you have healthier meals. You know, everything expands. Or the printing press. You know, once you have the printing press, now you can share ideas in a way that you never could before. And all these things came with you know, cultural movements, the printing press and, you know, the Reformation or um, interestingly enough, I think democracies and fiat currencies kind of came, you know, kind of were constructed in tandem, like in Greece and Rome, you know, and you get all these boom, boom, boom in the internet. And Bitcoin is one of those technologies. And, and once it, once it establishes itself, then the prosperity and the liberties that are built on top of it can be built on top of it. And it's, you know, it's it's like the, it's like the next industrial revolution. Like this, this is the change that people was going to happen with the internet. Yeah. So we, we got the internet, it people, but, this is the societal change that people were predicting because as of now the internet is is um it functions to serve existing systems better so banks are connected you and i are connected it it, it, so far the internet has done everything that we already do Mm -hmm. a lot better and that's been great it's been really good for society, but the actual, like the actual advancement of uh, culture and civilization that the internet is going to bring to us is Bitcoin. It, the internet is a bootloader for Bitcoin, right? And Bitcoin is the next advancement in the human paradigm, civilization, yeah. humanity, yeah. What, whatever, you. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, awesome. Um, so, um, <laughs> so Anthony, uh, before we wrap this up, what, what kind of uh, suggestions or, rec- or, or how, how would you, how, like, would you, how would you improve the education or the, you know, the enlightenment of people out there? Because, you know, I mean, this is also one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is to, you know, sure. inspire, educate, of course, you know, whatever, Austrian economics, Bitcoin, the, the bigger picture behind, Bit, you know, behind Bitcoin. Uh, what's your message, out the, you know, to the people out there? What's my message to the people out there? Or how do I tell people? Well, people, yeah. people come, everybody comes to Bitcoin in their own way, in their own time. So for Bitcoiners, the message is, you know, just be ready. Just be prepared. Your family members, your friends are going to come and they, cause they know that you're a Bitcoiner. So when X news story hits or whatever viral thread shows up on their social media, they're going to come to you. So just be prepared for that. If I know Bitcoiners, every Bitcoiner is always prepared for that. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some key concepts that orange pill people and that's the scarcity right you know that you know what is uh what is bitcoin bitcoin is all the wealth that has ever been created and all the wealth that ever will be created equally divided into 21 million shares (laughs) bitcoin is volatile um bitcoin is doing today the same thing it did yesterday and tomorrow it'll do the same thing it's doing today it's not bitcoin that's volatile it's the world that's volatile right Exactly. You know, and just just you know be be prepared for that and um we're we're ahead of the game just hodl hang on to it 
yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, hey, Anthony, I'm going to get you back, you know, sometime maybe in the future, uh, we have a panel discussion, you know, sure. be a cool thing, you know, with the three or four of us, you know, whoever, but we have, you know, some good, really good, cool people in the Bitcoin community space. And, you know, let's go a little bit d deeper down the rabbit hole. I'm doing wonderful. How are you? Nice to, nice to see you in person. Well, thank you for your time, you know, uh, uh, pretty much more or less spontaneously. So, you know, you, uh, you, you, I don't know, you came out of nowhere on Twitter. I, I didn't know you, to be honest. <laughs> I didn't know you before that. So, but you, you went, you know, with your Twitter thread somehow viral, partially a little bit dramatic <laughs> Twitter threads. You wrote, <laughs> but I really loved it. And... Um, so yeah, uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, you know, to my listeners, like where you come from, how you get to Bitcoin, what's your path, uh, your journey? Sure. Um, so I'm I'm in uh, the Bay Area. I'm probably about 20 minutes away from San Francisco without traffic. And um, I just recently signed up for Twitter. I, I kind of left Facebook because, you know, Facebook is just turning into more and more of a dumpster fire. I just didn't want to deal with it anymore. So I figured I'd give Boomers. Twitter a go. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, like I didn't even check it that much. I just followed a few people on crypto Twitter and, you know, whatever celebrity or news personality was interesting. And yeah. Um, yeah, and and then I'm just you know we're we're about to hit a new all time high, you know the big Bitcoin, you know everybody's excited, right? And I just saw everybody constantly uh, posting things about FOMO, 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 and I'm just like, that's not what this is, you know. So then I I wrote that the rant, it, yeah, it's a little dramatic, but I was I was having fun, you know. So I just kind of just put it out there like, hey dummies, like. This is not the same thing. What's going on here is, is something different. And yeah, it, I think I went to bed. I, I wrote it before I went to bed, you know, how Twitter works, right? <laughs> and then I woke up and I went from like 20 followers to, you know, 1,200 followers. Oh. And the, the tweet had been like, you know, all around the world, I got people saying, "Oh, I'm going to translate this in my language." And seriously, which boxes. one? Uh, like your Twitter threads? <laughs> which one? Because you've uh, written like so many, like by now. Uh, there's yeah, one, you know where that, you, that, the rant. Yeah, yeah, it's the rant. Everybody likes the rant. <laughs> it's it's been a week, and I'm still getting notifications on that on that one post about people uh, retweeting it or making a comment or whatever. So it's been. It's been fun seeing people react to it, but mostly positive. And you know, you know, your tweet um, made an impact when you start getting like XRP shills jumping in, and um, <laughs> I was just like, "Wow, yeah, people are paying attention." So it, it, it's been cool. It's been fun. I um, I bought my first Bitcoin in uh, 2018, and I was I was aware of it. I was aware of Bitcoin, but wasn't really paying attention um, and just Joe Rogan, just uh, shilling the cash app like mm -hmm. on every episode. Yeah. Cash app, cash app, cash app. I was like, all right, let me check it out. And then the cash app of course is ridiculously easy mm -hmm. to use and onboard. And then, you know, I think I bought like $50 worth. And then I was like, all right, let me, let me see what this is really about. So the first thing when you go and Google it, you'll get like charts and you won't really get information like about what Bitcoin is. You'll get all the, the TA, the speculative, the various FUD or, or whatever. But then you take a look at a chart. And at that time in 2018, the price was at like 5,000. So you look at the chart and you see that, 2017 pump and then you see the huge dip and i'm not like a finance expert but it's on its way back up so you just take a look at the one simple chart from you know 2010 to where we we're currently at and i'm like oh wow this thing's whatever this is it's kind of on its way back up it looks like i'm kind of buying at a bottom here 
and then uh, I enjoy podcasts. So I started downloading, you know, whatever I could. And uh, yeah, it, uh, two years later, I'm just like, yeah, let's do this. You know, this is the thing. Bitcoin fixes that. <laughs> so that's that's are pretty much that, my story. Um, there's no like, are you saying there's no FOMO on any like um, on on any level, like any sort of buyers? No, I'm not saying it on any level. So I was definitely being a little bit over dramatic. The actual rant itself, it was just everywhere. It was like, win FOMO, win FOMO, win FOMO. <laughs> and so when, when people are talking about FOMO, they're talking about it in the context of 2017, oh. where retail investors were opening up their piggy banks and just dumping things and are maxing out credit card debt. Or, you know, people were doing like people were making bad decisions and, you know, putting themselves at risk and doing silly things and just, you know, just quintessential fear of missing out. I, yeah. I will, let, let's empty out the kid's college fund and buy some Bitcoin. And uh, so when I say there will be no, I mean, that, that is not what's going on. There will always be um, retail like individuals who are FOMOing, but as far as like an intense, coordinated FOMO retail boom, that's not going to happen. I would absolutely enjoy that. That sounds wonderful. Really enjoy yeah, that talk, know. Anthony. All right. Have a good weekend. All right. Thanks. Have so a much. wonderful weekend. Bye. You're very welcome.